today's talk is all about the wreck of the UB116, which is a submarine that is was sunk in Hoxha Sound right at the end of the Second World War. Uh, sorry, the First World War, my apologies. Um, the beginning for me was following a dive. Uh, I saw the wreck and rather than just look at the picture, we're going to have a look at the 3D model because it gives you more of a view about what's on the seabed. Now, submarines, by their nature of construction, with pressure hulls and structural components tend to be in reasonably good form. But as you can see from this wreck, it's in pieces. And this piqued my interest. Why is it why are the parts of it scattered all over all over the seabed? And why has it lost its real form and structure? What happened? We'll come back to the 3D model in a bit. So but for now we'll, we'll walk through the rest of the story because it's 100 years now, uh, or just over 100 years, since it was sunk. So that was the beginning. Um, I started, uh, the first dive on this was to gather images for photogrammetry to rebuild a 3D model of the wreck. And it was the first wreck that I really used what's called the Heart of Gold, which is a scooter and camera combo that allows me to just scoot around a wreck shooting, in this case, 1600 images to align into 3D. And as I was wandering around thinking, why is it in this mess? I started to think about the history and dig into it. And there was, there's been a lot of history about this wreck, but some of it isn't true. Just to wind things back a little bit further to 1914, um, to talk about why the Admiralty decided to protect Hoxha Sound. This was the first German submarine to enter Scarpa Flow. The U-18 slipped in, uh, unnoticed, unseen. And was and fortunately or unfortunately for them, they found the flow empty. So on the way out, they were spotted. And during the engagement, they were rammed by a mine sweeper, and the ship was so badly, or the submarine was so badly uh, damaged, it was scuttled. And it now lies in about 70 meters outside Hoxha Sound, in the Pentland Firth. And this is the logbook from from the ship, um, and you can see here. Uh, where are we? UB U18 sank. Away the boats. 26 survivors picked up. Uh, you'll notice here there's also four life boys were lost overboard. I think this is a quartermaster doing a bit of stock reconciliation uh, to make his numbers match. So that was 1914. Now um, fast forward then to um, 1918. Now the, obviously with the events of seeing a submarine slip into the flow and realizing it could slip out again almost unnoticed. The Admiralty started a, a research and development program to, to be able to detect submerged submarines. And the results of that were two things. Firstly, there was the indicator loop, which is a, a series of three cables that are stretched across the seabed and are used to sense the magnetic changes um, when, a, when a, something like a submarine passes over the top. There is a an indicator that sits inside one of the huts and when the needle swings and there is no surface traffic you can assume that there is a submarine a, a submerged submarine passing the indicator loop the second development was a remotely controlled minefield this allowed uh, the shore operators when the meat needle in the indicator loop moved to detonate remotely uh, mines laid on the seabed. So we're not talking contact mines or acoustic mines, there's a manual trigger. And this was quite important, we'll come on to why um, later. The third development was hydrophones. So they were able to listen to um, the, the sounds that a, a, a submerged submarine would make. And these these buildings here uh, show the, the built, the, the construction that was the, the construction that was put on Hoxha uh, one of the uh, on Flotter, sorry, not Hoxha, um, during the First World War, to house the people listening for the submarines, the, the quiet hut as it was called, and also the mining hut as well, where they would detonate the uh, minefield. Building after the war, uh, the, the Admiralty just left them behind, there was no purpose for them. One of the buildings, the silent hut, where the hydrophone operators sat, was moved by car across the island uh, to become part of a residential home. And eventually part of the uh, the stores, uh, the local shop on the island, and it now actually serves as the museum. So I think it's this hut here you can go and see today if you're up in Scarpa Flow and get across to Flotter. 
closing days of World War One were a, a strange time, and, and the UB-116 was the, the last submarine to be sunk uh, on operation during the war and before the armistice. And she was also the first submarine to be sunk by remote-controlled minefields. So um, why was she going to Scarpa Flow is, is, was one of the questions. Why, why was she heading there? And the answer was that Germany was at the, at the crux of defeat and the German Navy had mutinied. There was a, a last ditch plan to sail the high fleet, seas fleet into the Thames estuary, engage the Royal Navy and try and pressurize the British and apply um, pressure to the negotiations that, that, that they knew were coming. But the crews turned around and said, this is this is insane. We're not doing this. And they mutinied and they refused to sail. But the UB-116 did sail. Um, she sailed right at the end. On the 22nd, looking at the logbook, 22nd, uh, she was having a new periscope fitted. And on the 24th, she was in Heligoland in the North Sea uh, alongside the depot ship seen here, HMS Hess, uh, SMS Hessen. This is the boat. Um, this is the, one of the plans uh, that was done by the Admiralty after the war for the 103 to 117 class. She was a fairly small submarine, but very effective, um, intending, intended to work the coastal waters. She left Heligoland on the 25th of October in command of uh, uh, Captain Emsman, and what was then um, believed to be or alleged at times an all-officer crew. We'll come on to the all-officer crew story later. Um, but she left at 8.30 in the morning. She set the course 310 and Heligoland was behind her. This is the last entry in the logbook between the 25th of October and the 28th of October when she was sunk in Scarpa Flow. I have a sneaking suspicion that the crew and particularly the captain knew that this was a one-way journey. The intention was to sink as many warships in the flow as possible to again to pressurize the allies and, and during the forthcoming peace treaty they kind of felt i think there was no point keeping a logbook it's a one-way trip no one's ever going to read it what they didn't know was british intelligence was intercepting their radio signals and they were recorded being uh, departed, not knowing where they were going, but heading out. So the British had cracked their signals and knew what was happening. Scarpa Flow, biggest natural anchorage uh, used by the Royal Navy during the First and Second World War. Um, the, um, the entrance to the flow is through Hoxha Sound here, one of the main entrances. German intelligence had said that the um, the sound was not mined. They had witnessed surface vessels transiting it, no problem. Uh, there were anti-submarine booms uh, and, and nets, but also there was the submerged uh, manually triggered minefield. And this led the Germans to believe there were no mines and the flow was unprotected. This was obviously wrong uh, because on the night of the 28th, UB-118 was, well, well, sorry, 116 was detected by the hydrophones and the, the mines were triggered. And you can see one of the uh, statements there from the, uh, the following reports into the sinking of the submarine, that they knew they'd destroyed a submarine that night. When I was up in Scarpa Flow last, oh, let me see, three or four years ago, I did this presentation and somebody came forward and said, my great grandfather or one of my relatives was um, mentioned in dispatches. Uh, and I think he was the same person commanding the hydrophone hut. And I read the report um, of the hydrophone officers, the hydrophone hut. And sure enough, um, Lieutenant Commander uh, Percy Windust was the gentleman, and this is him. So nearly 100 years later, to read the report in the National Archives and then put a face to the name is is, is rare, but absolutely delightful. So Percy was the man in charge of the hut the night as the submarine tried to sneak in. Typically with the Royal Navy, when something goes wrong, someone is to blame. Um, and the 
the Navy were naturally concerned that the submarine had got through one of the boom nets. There are two nets, uh, north and south, and they got through the, the southern net. And the finger of blame was pointed at the officer in charge of the boom nets. Uh, from the whole report, you can see that they were trying to hang him out to dry and blame him. Uh, thankfully for him, he had kept complaining about how long nets last and how many nets he needed and how repairing nets was impossible and how getting supplies of nets was almost impossible too, right up to including the flag officer for Scotland. All of his complaints, all of his issues were ignored. So when it came to blaming him for the nets, he could turn around and point to the stack of paperwork and say, I'm sorry, um, I've been telling you for 18 months that a, a net will only last 18 months and it won't last any longer. And you should have replaced the nets and made me help me replace the nets. And the telling thing about the Board of Inquiry is that after his letter saying, I've been telling you for months, years, that my nets are not lasting, the whole inquiry is just shut down and ignored. It's forgotten. With the UB116 on the seabed, um, the, the, the Admiralty, and particularly the Director of Naval Intelligence, wanted um, to get inside the ship, inside the boat, and get as much intelligence out of it. And there were a group of divers during the First World War called the Tin Openers. Their job, sailing from this yacht, the Cory Sea, was to investigate stricken submarines on the seabed and using the old hard hat, uh, hand cranked air pump diving sets, get inside the wreck and uh, recover whatever they could, particularly codes, code books, charts, maps of minefields. And they were so good at it, the Germans didn't realize um, that, 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 that they had this, this, we had this team operating and they actually thought there was a spy sharing information. The ship, the Cory Sea, was privately chartered, was a private yacht and it was chartered by the Admiralty for I think 56 pounds uh, a month which doesn't sound much, but in today's terms, it's about £6,500, I think. So uh, the owner of the yacht, Mr. Miller of Cavendish Place in London, did, did very nicely from his hire of his yacht during the war. Corey Sear went on to be bought by the Admiralty halfway through the war uh, before being sold off at the end of it to Greek shipping line and used as a ferry in the Greek islands. And she was sunk during the first, Second World War by the uh, uh, to stop the Germans getting hold of her. This is a photograph of one of UB-116's sisters. This is the UB-110. Now, uh, one of the commanding officers of the tin openers, uh, Commander Wheeler, had perfected the technique of raising the submarine. So not only we get the code, the code books and the, and the charts, we get the whole boat. And he had just raised the UB-110 off Whitby. You can see it here in dry dock. It's got the bow missing, but otherwise pretty good condition. And he was ordered to go north to Scarpa Flow to work with uh, Commander Daman, who was already on site, and lift the 116. These are the internal shots of the U-boat. It's quite rare to see these. Uh, found these in one of the one of the archives. And this is the space that the hard hat divers would have had to work in, except these have been tidied up, cleaned up, and drained of water. They're cramped, narrow difficult to negotiate, difficult to navigate, and when it's damaged, even worse, and it's pitch black as well. So how these guys worked in these conditions using primitive dive gear, I, I really don't know. I wouldn't go in a submarine today, let alone um, in a hard hat kit. The survey of the salvage team did manage to get inside the, inside the 116, and they did get everything out of it that they believed they could. But for some reason, Director of Naval Intelligence really wanted that submarine raised. Why? Don't know. No record in the in the archive has turned up to say why they, it felt it was so important. Uh, in the end, um, two things happened. Firstly, the team on site reported that the submarine was badly damaged and there'd been an internal torpedo explosion. Um, there had also been the damage of the mines and subsequent depth charges. And they were worried that if they were raising the submarine, the bow was going to break off and the, bow, the, sub, the torpedoes were going to 
hit the seabed, detonate, cause all sorts of problems. So in the end, the decision to raise was cancelled, primarily because the war was over as well by now. The armistice had been signed. There was no more fighting. Reading the report, you get the feeling that Commander Wheeler and his team had just had enough and they didn't want to raise the submarine and they didn't want to risk their lives anymore. And they just thought, you know what, we've done our bit. That's it. It's over. We're not fighting. Why raise it? So it wasn't raised. Interesting picture here of the submarine. There's a little you know, picture of the damage around the conning tower and at the bow. Because fast forward a little bit, just bear that picture in mind. UB116 was then pretty much forgotten for a few years, except um, C.S. Forrester wrote a play called the U97, and it is believed to be based on the 116. Um, it's a tale of nationalism, of sacrifice and honour, and being very German-centric, probably no surprise that it wasn't performed in the UK and didn't appear to be very popular. However, it was translated into German and became um, uh, Deutschland die Fahrt des UB116. Sorry, can't remember what 116 is in German, but basically it's the story of the 116. And it was played nine times, I believe, from 1933, which at the time, the rise of National Socialism could only mean that you were either on the approved list and popular with the censor and broadcast, or you weren't. So the story of what happened had already started to inspire, inspire others. Then in 1940, UB-116 was found again, uh, this time by HMS Challenger, which was a survey uh, vessel operated by the Royal Navy. And it was reported to the Hydrographic Office that there was a submarine in Hoxha Sound, um, clearly an old one. And interestingly, the diver, the first diver down, Abel Seaman, was confident that she'd not sustained observable damage to the pressure hull, which if you bear in mind, the sketch picture uh, from Wheeler's notes showing the bow hanging off and showing a hole in the control room. It does, does make you wonder which one of them was narked or which one of them wanted to tell a story. I don't know. Clearly a slight discrepancy in, in what, the, what the, the diver found in 1940 compared to the, the wreck in 1918. These are the documents confirming um, that uh, confirming what they found. On the left is the report from the commanding officer of HMS Challenger, and on the right is the hydrographic office replying, and um, they're confirming that it is the UB-116, and it was sunk on the 28th of October, and it's not a new U-boat U -boat you found. We know about it, thanks very much. And after that, she's marked on the chart as a wreck. Um, it's interesting the position they gave here confirms and correlates with Damant's uh, uh, position that he recorded in 1918. And that's another little story that we'll pick into in a little bit. We then fast forward to the 1960s. And in the 1960s, the UB116 was bought by a salvage company called Metal Recoveries of New Haven. Um, she was bought and salvaged and worked. and the, the here the story starts to get a little bit cloudy. Um, there is a book by Keith Jessup called Goldfinder, in which he recounts his life leading up to the recovery of the gold from HMS Edinburgh. And he was working in Orkney at the same time. And it was quite clear that there was pr professional and personal rivalry between him and the New Haven Company. And he regales in his book, uh, if you've ever read it, called Go the book called Goldfinder, about um, these this salvage company that managed to detonate a torpedo and damage their ship so badly, um, their salvage vessel so badly that it had to be towed into St. Margaret's Hope and it broke an engine mount, it shattered the crockery, you, you name it, it had broken it. And it was, it was reported with some glee that you know this rival company was having trouble. And uh, eventually um, the UB116 was then sold at auction to a local Orkney man. Um, but this part of the story starts to explain why the UB116 is currently and today shredded in a mess, very much a scrapyard. She was worked for scrap during the 1960s, which bearing in mind um, there was a um, 
you know, it's the grave of 30 odd German sailors. It's not something we'd entertain today, but it does reflect different times and different values. We then nip forward a little bit to 1973. Um, the Yom Kippur War triggered an oil embargo um, with, the, with the Western countries, for, with the Arab nations. Um, I managed to find in my dad's effects after he died. Um, don't know why he kept them, uh, but some petrol coupons from 1973. Um, the trigger for this really, or the, the, the outcome of this was North Sea oil suddenly became possible and financially viable. So 1974, they start building an oil terminal at Flotter. And you can see here on the chart, there's the position of the UB116. There's the oil line and you know, it's right inside the now anchoring zone. And again, the story gets a little bit clouded in hearsay, um, but what I think has happened was that the Royal Navy were tasked with clearing the explosives from the wreck, the, the remaining torpedoes. And at that point, the rest of the submarine, whatever state it was in after the salvage people had worked it for a bit, was certainly gonna be shredded after that. Now, bomb disposal is not anything like cutting green wires and blue wires and working carefully to remove fuses. It's brutal. Um, you take down a four pound pack of explosive, you strap it onto the the ordnance and you retire to a safe distance. Uh, this is a photograph of a thousand pound bomb uh, functioning or high ordering as it's called. And that little there, that little blob is not dust on the sensor. It's a seagull coming out of the plume of water from the thousand pound bomb. So when they function, they are quite destructive. The shock wave damages things. I think it's another reason why the UB116 is in so many bits. Now, one of the rumours um, of of the UB116 was it was moved, it was raised and moved. Now, clearly, the report uh, from 1918 said it wasn't raised and moved, and where the it's been lifted stories come from, I don't know. Um, but if you check here, here's the contemporary chart marking the position. Demand's position in 1918 is here. The UK Hydrographic Office is right next to it. This wreck has not moved. It hasn't been lifted, it hasn't been raised. If anyone tells you have, I think they're wrong. Um, and the evidence, the evidence supports that. The other story that's persisted and one that I haven't been able to trace is that one of the tin openers, a guy called Dusty Miller, claimed that the, all of the crew were officers. They were all dressed in officer uniform when he broke into the submarine and when he worked his way through into the control room. Um, and they all had, they were carrying suitcases stuffed with civilian clothes. Now, this report appeared in a, in a newspaper article sometime after the war. I found no evidence to support it in the, in the archives, but Churchill does repeat it in one of his um, memoirs from the First World War as well. So whether it's true or not, I don't know. Still looking for evidence on that one. So today, um, Wreck is at peace, really. Um, on the left, you can see a digital ele elevation model from, from the photogrammetry. You can see it's a very low lying wreck, 25 meters from a 30 meter seabed. And here on the sonar, you can see the scattered remains of the submarine, either through salvage or through demolition. Now, I've got a little, in the, in the book that I've written, the iBook that is written, uh, available on iTunes, um, there is the there is the model of the wreck available, but rather than look at it here, we're going to have a look at it in more detail with the photogrammetry. Um, if we start at the bottom of the wreck, um, the one thing that we can absolutely prove is the stern uh, hydroplanes are in a in geographically correct position for a submarine heading north into the into the flow this is the stern of the submarine we have the remains of the conning tower area and the control room here and to the north we've got the the bow and anchor winch and up here we've got the conning tower we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail this is the author mosaic of the of the of the wreck site um, i find these really powerful tools because what you can do is start to pick over what's there and identify things that you just didn't realize were present during the dive itself. I've only done two dives on the UB-116. You can see this one here. 
Uh, I covered the main site in 2016 and in 2017 managed to add on the conning tower. If we have a look down here near the engine room, if we zoom in, you can see here there is a, a camshaft either for fuel injection, she had two big diesel engines, or for the, the valves from the main engine. And if we just pan across to the right here, zoom out a little bit, there we go. This is the upper portion of the bolt of the pressure hull, or the remains of it, and these are the two main engine exhausts. Just here is a mystery object. I've looked at this many times. I think it's a small, um, gener like, like a donkey engine or a starter for the main engine. I've yet to identify that part. There are air tanks all over the wreck, and as you pan round, you start to see them lie everywhere. I think there's another engine camshaft here. And then moving forward, we move into the area of the conning tower. This section here is actually part of the conning tower. We'll have a look at the conning tower. Just remember the shape because it's half of the, the fin or the conning tower itself. Um, and if we just move again further to the north, we've got here the reinforced underside of the pressure hull where the deck gun mounts. Now the deck gun, just in case you're wondering, was raised by the tin openers in 1918 because, in their words, it was dangerous. I just wondered if they fancied a bit of bronze uh, or gun metal uh, for the lads. I don't know. Uh, moving forward further north again, more air tanks. And if we just zoom in here, we've got the anchor winch. You can see the individual pockets for the anchor chain run through this, this pulley. Uh, there's another pulley here as well. And then moving much further northeast now, we find the conning tower. And this section here is missing, but is, is remains on the main site. So the, the photogrammetry, particularly the ortho photo, allowed me to really pick into the wreck and understand it and, and relate to it more and find these things and realize that the submarine is in the right place, is heading north, can prove it's heading north. We've got main engine air inlet here air tanks, electrical cables, all these parts of, basically much of the submarine is still there, it's just very much in kit form. So whilst up in Orkney, um, I went to the museum and they knew I was working on a book about it. And they said, we've got this wheel, um, this hand wheel, this brass wheel, and it's labeled from German submarine, but we don't know which one. We think it's the UB116, what what do you think? I said, well, I, I don't know, I'll measure it and have a look. And from the builder's plans of one of her sisters, you can see this wheel here, which is the hydrophone wheel. And it's always risky scaling off engineering drawings, but the, the scale of this matches the scale of the hand wheel. So we think this is now almost certainly a hand wheel, a hydrophone hand wheel from, from the UB116. So it's... And as I've said, there were two books we've published. We've actually only got one available at the moment, which is the story of UB116 on iBooks. Thistlegorn book is currently out of print, but may be coming back in Mandarin or Simplified Chinese very soon. So watch this space. And with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, I hope you found it interesting. And it now just gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce next week's speakers, who will be the team from Womast. Um, so please make sure you come back for that one.